I, I'm very I'm, I'm quickly, born ready. I'm very quickly going to make some announcements and then get off the screen so that you all can take over. Welcome everyone to the second session of a seat at the table conversations at the crossroads of health inequities in education. Um, if you came last week, session one, we covered thriving in America are the odds stacked against you. Tonight, we'll be talking about thriving in schools, how your environment shapes your choices. Now, I don't want to do any injustice to tonight's session, but I think we might have saved the best for last because session three, thriving in the BPL solution, we're going to be hosting students who are implementing health solutions in their schools. So heavy on the youth voice next week. As a reminder, if you've been to the first two sessions, next week's session is on Tuesday, not on Wednesday. So adjust your calendar. Um, if you need to register for the next session or you just wanna understand and share with other folks what this whole thing is, the website to learn more about this whole series is bit.ly slash BPL underscore heal two. And please note, uh, bit.ly URLs are always case sensitive. So if I've used capital letters, you must as well. So BPL is uppercase, heal is uppercase. I am of course joined by our hosts, Danique Marshall davis We are pleased tonight to be joined in just a moment by Dr. Kofi Essel and Stephen Rick. So they're gonna join us in just a moment. I do wanna let folks know that one thing we didn't do last week, if you have questions in real time, uh, one of our colleagues is on the BP Living Twitter feed. So if you wanna pose a question to at BP underscore living on Twitter. Uh, you might get a response in real time. If you don't, we'll go back and look at those later and make sure we catch your questions. So head on over to Twitter, at least follow BP Living. But if you have a question tonight too, we'll try to answer. With that, I'm gonna stop share, hand it back over to Danique and Marsha Gale. Let's get going. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You, Marsha Gale. You yes, know sir. This is? You hear that? America's health is a problem. Is that, is that it? Can you, are you able to hear that right there? Who, who is that? Yeah, it's just whack, whack, whack. This whole thing is just whack. Whack, this whole situation is ridiculously whack. Health from this whack food with this whack mood. Whack, cause we don't move. It's whack, it's just so whack. It's just whack, whack, whack. I had, whack. I had to put some of it It's just whack, whack. This whole situation is ridiculously whack. Health from this whack food, but this whack mood. Why? Cause we don't move this whack. It's just so whack, so whack. This I gotta ask you, Marsha Gill. First of all, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Donique Dolly. I'm an educator, and I'm here with the one and only Dr. Marsha Gill Davis. Talk to me about that. What makes you want to do that? You are not only a doctor, obviously, you're also. You're making great music. Well, I am here with the one and only Dr. D. <laughs> Dr. Danny <laughs> Dolly. Dr. D, Dr. D. I love that um, BP Living puts that up. But to your question, um, really, that was, so I'm a creative person. When I think about myself, you kind of cut me in half, half of my brain science, half of its art, which kind of reflects how the brain is, right? I left brain, but that's just how I exist. And I'm as heavily passionate about science and biology that was my major in college as i am about art and expressing myself creatively so this um what i call a modern day public servants an announcement through a song uh, through hip-hop is really my way of creatively commenting on the status of health in the u.s at this point in time and trying to really get people to listen and understand where we are from a health standpoint and why it's so important that we really have to work to do something about this. So that was my way of trying to express myself. And that's what it's about right there. I think we, you, you pointed something out. And, uh, and you know, this is our seat at the table, health inequities in education. This is uh, episode two. What you gonna do? And we're talking about thriving in schools, how your environment shapes your choices. Um, and we have to do whatever it takes to get people to listen. So I appreciate the fact that you created a song, you know, and, and we're even doing this right here to get people to listen. Um, this is the second one. I just want to, how'd you think the first one? We did the first one and that was about the larger system. We had two guests. That blew my mind. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Help me out. That was a lot. That was a lot. I'm still taking all that in. 
Um, yeah, yeah. It was a lot of. Go ahead. It was, it was you, a lot of. Yeah, how do you take it? <laughs> um, it was a lot of knowledge dropped, like legit. Not only from the standpoint of the facts around why we're in this situation from a health, you know, when we're looking at health status in the U.S. and and um, there's the landscape of people's experience, you know, in life with how how their health is, but also the personal experience. Um, you know, Kadira shared a lot of the, the facts on that and then Jackie shared her personal experience like living in um, what we understand to be this state of health, which is the fact that the US being the one of the most resource countries has one of the poorest health um, statuses and that just makes no sense. It makes absolutely right. no sense. And one of the biggest contributors So that is having the impact of her environment shape how she, you know, developed, how she understood her health, how she lived, um, what her health was, and then what she was able to do to turn it around. So I thought it was really good. I think we got most of that. You did a little Disney movie. You got frozen for a second, but we, you know, we got you out of that. Goodness. It's all right. We, good. we got we, we, we got it. We got it. I think when, one thing I am hearing from this is it's a larger topic than we explain it a lot. It's um, it's on a personal level. It's it's not just cultural, it, and it's in it's in many fast facets and aspects of our country. The um the health and the disparities. Um, speaking of which, I, I just got throw this at you because it relates um, just thinking about whack and one part we talk about food and we talk about things like that. And then we think about neighborhoods and some that happened this week um, that was whack to me um, goes to my neighborhood in the Bronx. And um, you know, the, the, the building that where the people died of doing it in the fire. Um, and it makes me think about conditions once again, for those who are within poverty, um, those in certain struggles or, you know, it's just like, when can th how can things be get better, man? That's all right. Because it's whack on too many levels. Right. And then I'll just end with this because it relates to who we have coming up also. Maybe you want to speak on them and we can let them in soon. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, what can we do to, you know, with the youth, like, you know, their environment? You do, this one is called thriving in schools and how your environment shapes your choices, right? And um, your environment, and that's why I brought up the Bronx, because it's that environment. That's that's the hood. That's their, their neighborhood. Like my, it was my, my neighborhood growing up, you know. And it's not you can't you don't always separate school and the neighborhood, right? Um, so hopefully we get into some of that today. I just want to understand what we can do in schools today when we talk mm -hmm. about all this. Um, yeah, and, and anything you want to add to today, but and anything you think about just the Bronx, I just want to throw that out there and. Just it's it did happen. Re really it's the it's the reality so schools are just a microcosm of the society uh you know where your school is is really representing your your community and um schools are just as powerful as an environment because think about it young people are spending majority of their time in this environment from the age of what five to 20 potentially um but but that's your everyday interaction your everyday living and so much can be shaped in the environment of a school and the school in has influence on people so I, I that's what i want us to be able to answer some of these questions of um what's the kind of power that a school has in shaping a student's trajectory particularly our own health that's something that we haven't discussed enough and how much that can set people up for a trajectory that's either positive or negative and then how do we do that like who's in charge of that Who's supposed to be helping with that? How do we do that? So, so our guest today, we have um, two awesome people. We have um, Stephen Ritz. He is the um, head at uh, Green Bronx Machine. Yes. Um, and, <laughs> and we also have Dr. Kofi SL, who's a pediatrician in DC um, and also um, very passionate about lifestyle medicine. So welcome. Welcome, welcome. And we'd just love for you guys to, you know, give a little brief 
introduction on who you are, you know, wh why you're passionate about this intersection of health equity education. So I'm um, gonna start off with you, Stephen. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. If I knew we were gonna open up with that song, I would have had on my tango instead of my cheese hat. That said, um, <laughs> as we start, it is a sad time and a sad moment here in the Bronx. And I certainly wanna put that up there first and foremost, because it is absolutely emblematic of everything we will be speaking about. Um, but let me mitigate by that saying that I go forward and uh, I am the chief eternal optimist of the Brown Bronx of Bronx County, the CEO of Bronx County. I am a, a first and foremost, I'm a resident, I'm a parent, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a father, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. And I, I, I walk here these streets each and every day. Um, I've been asked to graduate elsewhere and I've been asked to work elsewhere, um, but here I am. And um, you know, I'm proud to be doing the work that I do and, and grateful to have a seat at this table because more often than not, people like us, we're not even invited in the room. Um, so I'm here to talk some truth and, um, and, and spread some good word and spread opportunity to shout out to all my fellow educators, uh, Jeff Palladino, if you're out there, holler and uh, Andrew Sherman, if you're down south watching, what up? But let's get to business. Kofi, talk about you. Love it. I love it. I, I can't follow that. I can't follow that. Um, so, so my name is, is Kofi. Yes, I'm a community pediatrician in Washington, D.C. Um, I do a lot of work in, I'm a researcher and, and clinician and educator as well uh, for medical students. Uh, I do a lot of work in the areas of food insecurity um, and diet-related chronic diseases such as obesity as well. So excited to be here and have this conversation. Um, clearly, I engage with a ton of uh, kids who are in the school systems and and so I hear a lot vicariously through that experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and of course, with the work that I'm doing as well. And thank you Ooh. for that work. Thank you for that work. And thank you both for your work, all three. Uh, we, we, thank, we thank everyone. And uh, this, is, this is what it's about. We're bringing, you know, it's, it's always humbling to bring, to have, you know, doctors here and educators. I'm an educator, so I can be around educators and teachers. I'm used to that. But talk to doctors is kind of humbling. Um, I have a, I have a question uh, for for you, Kofi, if you don't mind. I just, you know, um, was wondering if you can describe like what's going on with health of our young people um, in this country right now in America. What do you, what are you seeing? Um, especially the different health issues that are, may come up as well as um, any differences among ethnic groups that we might, or racial groups that are, are worth noticing or illuminating? Yeah, no, uh, great question. I, I think there's a, a lot of ways of taking, taking that question. And I think one frame of that is thinking about income, poverty, wealth. Uh, we know there's a huge wealth gap. Uh, we, we can kind of dive into that wealth gap, but we know it, when you look at that wealth gap, African-American populations, or uh, Hispanic or Latino populations, you can see that there is an eight time and five time decrease in wealth as compared to white American populations. So white American populations about $188,000, um, African American populations about 26 and, uh, and the Latino Latino populations about 36,000. So it's an eight time and five time drop. And of course, if you start to paint the picture of why that occurs, it's not because some are better at saving, others are not, right? And I always, right, really do uh, my, my due diligence in emphasizing that, especially when I speak to my students and recognizing, I know what you may have heard, I know what the biases are, I know what these things that we may have taken on over the years, but the reality is these are systemic structures that have led to what we see to this day. So when you think about sort of children as a whole, uh, you know, there's about a third of, of households with children that are experiencing sort of that low income status, less than 200% of the federal poverty line. And we know that poverty in itself is very expensive, right? It, it's an oxymoron. Poverty itself right. is very expensive. It's, so it's, it in itself is a, is a toxic stress that a lot of uh, families and mm. kids endure. And that kind of toxic stress is unrelenting. It doesn't relieve itself, right? So when the engine is gunned over and over again, when someone is experiencing that unrelenting stress, what happens? Where does that go? We know it has permanent effects on the architecture of the brain, right? Making one more anxious, making one have a quicker stress response, making one have go from zero to 100 with something little that goes on, one affecting one's focus, their concentration, their memory, 
right? So you go into the school, you're carrying all this weight, this baggage from your experiences, right? Which are oftentimes environmental. You take it into the classroom. You don't come in there as a blank slate and it affects your ability to thrive in the classroom. So we know all these things affect the children that we see, the children that we care, I care for in my clinic. I know this is affecting them in the classroom. And oftentimes, unfortunately, sometimes they're given labels, right? They're given these labels that stays along with them. And at the end of the day, when we kind of think about as a whole, what a lot of our children are affected by, that toxic stress, unrelenting stress is one of the things I see over and over again. That's a great, mm. great point just about um, coming in, not as a blank slate. There's so much going on around and just the idea of me the mental health part of it that we don't always talk about, um, how that's kind of sets you up um, to be primed, <laughs> right? To already have difficulty even being in your school environment. Like you said, you're kind of primed, your, um, your fight or flight system is already primed. So you're not able to concentrate, you're more anxious, you're more hypersensitive to things. I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the state of chronic disease in young people, because that's something where we're seeing a lot of these adult diseases that are now very becoming very common in young people, like type two diabetes. They're, they're, they're children who are developing these types of diseases. So can we kind of get a sense of um, that as well? And like the obesity rate for children, how that's changed significantly over time. Wow. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it goes back to the environment oftentimes, right? Like um, definitely hands down in my clinical spaces, I'm seeing a lot more uh, hypertension. I'm seeing a lot more diabetes. I'm, I'm referring a lot of in, uh, kids who are now having pre-diabetes at earlier ages. Obesity rates are definitely going up as well to some degree anecdotally across the board. You're seeing little blips here and there. At the end of the day, um, we like to hyper-focus on obesity oftentimes, but that's just but one marker right. Right, of, mm -hmm. of sort of that global health status, right? And I think it's important to, to recognize that and to realize that. I think in general, even with COVID, uh, I, I mean, I can tell you stories from my colleagues who often have, have come to me and, and they, they've said this very thing. It's like in tears, like my patient has gained 50 pounds of this last year. Diet and exercise can't be enough, right? Like what are we doing wrong? What can we do about this, right? So telling me this is what they've seen, this is what they've been experiencing. And then the question of what do we do? How do we respond to that? In general, we're seeing these things happening across the board. We're seeing these rates increasing across the board. And we as clinicians have to be more and more equipped to figure out as a pediatrician, how to then address sort of more adult focused diseases that we didn't focus on as much in our training. We focus on them to some degree, but not as much as uh, Marshall Gale, you all did uh, to the same extent. So this is something that we, we've seen across the board. It's something that we're, we're trying to get a, a better handle on. And for sure, it's, it's an, a, a reflection of environment, community, the way we subsidize certain foods, right? Like it, it, I can go on and food insecurity, right? Toxic stressors. These stressors are big factors that lead to disease as well. Not just, you know, did I diet? Did I exercise, right? All these factors really matter. Mm -hmm. so this, this is helpful, to but... Go ahead, Danny. No, you're, you're probably going where I'm going. I just want to go into the classroom a bit more. Like, yes. Because, and I'm, I'm going to invite you and Stephen, because I know I see in the classrooms and schools, we're dealing with this a lot. And, um, but we're not. It's like uh, if we have a lot of students that may have issues, it's almost like, at least when I was working as a principal, you know, I, I have to mind my business and just follow the IEP. I can try to influence things. But um, I don't know if I always, I don't know if I believed I could. Um, well, just add you and Stephen, uh, what are you seeing or what are you, uh, well, and what are you doing about it? So, well, what I'm doing is I refuse to accept the things I cannot change. I'm going to change what I can't accept. And for me, it all starts with kids and it all starts with public schools. Um, you know, I've been doing this since the early 80s. Um, that's a lot of decades in the South Bronx. And what are we seeing? We're seeing kid, kids get sicker. We're seeing them get fatter. We're seeing life expectancies go down despite all this amazing technology in the world. Um, so is it part of a larger plan? Is it design or default? Well, we could have a whole nother show on that. But let's talk about what it really has to do with. It has to do with environment. Listen, if you put a seed, and I'm a farmer of some sort, so I'm somewhat of an urban farmer, and that's a separate story. But if you put a seed in the ground and that seed doesn't thrive, uh, you don't blame the seed. 
you tend to look at the conditions. We look at the environment. And sadly, we give seeds and plants more respect than we give children. Um, because, you know, our children are in thriving and it's not because of them. It's not because of their parents. It's because of the conditions that we have placed them in. And systemically, they have gotten worse as the gap divides with each and every passing generation. Um, you know, you can't go from seed to harvest without cultivation in the middle. And this work is 100 percent about cultivation. But, you know, look at look at some of the things that we're seeing in our generation. We're seeing the onset of childhood puberty. And I'm sure Dr. Kofi could talk about that far more uh, eloquently and accurately than I can. But I'm seeing puberty in my school um, now as early as second grade, first and second grade. And that is childhood lost. A lot of that has to do with food, hormones, the intensification of, of, of a meat and dairy diet. It has to do with toxic levels of sugar that are stressing out the endocrine system. When you look at age, average age life expectancy in communities like ours, uh, you know, not only, not only only underfunded, we're over extracted in every sense in the word. We become the base for an economy of people who are trying to really get fat off our dysfunction. Um, so bringing it back to what do I do? You know, for me, the greatest lever this nation has to address poverty is public education. And I am an insurgent educator out here trying to gain, change the game. And I started with overage, undercredited children. And now I'm working with the youngest children possible because it's just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. And if you get them on the trajectory of good health at a young age, everything changes. And that, whether it's attitude, whether it's performance, whether it's dietary outcomes, you know, I'm thrilled to be raising the next generation of plant forward children in the middle of public housing. And, you know, along the way, they become social and environmental justice advocates and champions. Uh, you know, the young people at Fannie Lou Hamer, the work that Jeff's doing. I mean, like, you know, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about the we, because collectively, this is our moment to grow something greater. And it starts with one simple notion. The most important school supply in the world is food. And, and that may shock people in the digital age. It may shock some of my colleagues. But let me say it again slowly so you can write it down in case you're taking copious notes. The most important school supply in the world is food. Children will never be well read if they're not well fed. Um, try teaching children who are hungry. Try teaching children who are malnourished. When I was the dean uh, of the most dysfunctional high school in New York City, 256 felonies in a year, I might add, I would usually sit down in the room with kids. And the first question I would say is not whose fault what happened, but what'd you have for breakfast? And the answer was usually nothing, soda, chips, or cookies. That's an interesting thing to start. What do we know about kids who are big? Well, kids who are big, they don't get picked for the team at a young age. They're the last ones to get picked. They either bully or get bullied. And, and that attitude translates, and that pain and that trauma combined with everything, even pre-COVID, um, translates into generations of dysfunction um, that have really manifested themselves um, in all sorts of attention rates, all kinds of labels, as Dr. Kofi talks about, um, you know, all kinds of you know, ways to monetize these kids by labeling them. And, and, and it is, it's become a classic syndrome to kind of perpetuate the status quo. On the, on, the, so, on the hearts, backs, minds, lungs, and obesity rates of young children. It's just tragic. So here's a question related to it. In that environment of the school, what are schools doing that are harmful? And this is to all of us, um, harmful. And then, of course, we'll get to what can we do mm -hmm. to change it in that building. But, you know, in that school environment, what, what is, what's, what's happening that, that might be doing harm? Well, what's mm -hmm. happening that, that is doing harm? It's most often what we feed them. You know, it's no longer breakfast, birthplace, it's breakfast. It's no longer, uh, you know, lineage, it's lunch. You know, when we're feeding cheap kids cheap processed food that requires no chewing, uh, that has no fiber, that is high in fat, high in sugar, um, and really does not build immunity because we know the best way to build immunity is through the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. We are kind of if you will, steering kids into a life of the celebritization of food, the monetization of communities, the monetization of products, you know, life and, and food should not be something that comes to you in a Ziploc single serve, uh, you know, self steel can with infinite shelf life. It really should be something they grow. So what am I doing? Well, you know, I'm in school right now. I'm in a classroom that I built. 
Um, it's being replicated around the nation and around the world. And we grow food, copious amounts of food with kids all year long in the middle of public housing, four stories up in a 110 year old building. You know, we are doing something great. We're growing our own food. We're using it in school. We're sending it home to communities. We're sending it home to families. We're putting it into the cafeteria. And we're learning about being connected to this amazing thing, a living, breathing ecosystem. Instead of Shaquille O'Neal telling us to eat more pizza, buy more chocolate, buy more sneakers, uh, you know, all for the sake of his imprints and, you know, and, and his personal wealth. So th that's what we're doing. We're trying to change the game one classroom at a time, one kid at a time, one diet at a time, and linking it up to pedagogy and, and, and you know, and good solid instruction. One model uh, I'm sure the audience has heard about, and, and Danique, I think this is an area you know a lot about as well, but the the model that we often talk about is the WISC model. Um, this is sort of that that model uh, that that schools oftentimes are trying to center around. I think it's that ideal vision. This this idea of having a holistic perspective on the child. WISC is sort of whole school, whole community, whole child. Right, thinking holistically about the child, not only. Um, about sort of what they're learning in the classroom, right? Which is a small part of their overall education. And I think uh, what Stephen is highlighting is this education that, that kids are getting is far beyond what you can simply just uh, from, you can get from a textbook, right? Social emotional learning. We wanna make sure every child uh, has uh, a, a, is an opportunity to be challenged, uh, an opportunity to be healthy, uh, to be stress-free, right? These are the kind of things that we want to make sure we think about in addition to working with community, right? And engaging in the system, right? Families being part of community, healthcare, community, other community organizations. I'm sure, Stephen, you're working with a ton of different organizations as well as sort of that nice interchange and that integration. I think that's pretty, it's integral to doing this kind of work. One of the things that I think of I, I want to go down the food route, but I, I'm, I'm going to pause on that and hit on another route too, is mental health uh, provision, right? So when you think about toxic stress, when you think about mental health as a whole, we know that every child, no matter if you have a diagnosis, DSM-5 diagnosis or not, you deserve to have mental health, right? No matter if you have a diagnosis or not, you deserve to have, to be uh, able to live in a state of resilience, to be able to uh, thrive and, and be the best that you can be. And the reality is, this is something that schools aim to provide. So you mentioned something that's positive. The majority of healthcare or mental health care provided for children and adolescents are provided for them by school. We don't have enough provision outside of the school setting. So oftentimes, they're getting those mental health services from school, for better or for worse, right? So ideally, this is you know having the right counseling in school, social work, psychology, uh, other therapists at school, giving kids access, ultimately focus on education, yes, at the end of the day, but it is such an important piece for social emotional learning and for them to continue to thrive as well. So that mental health piece, I think, is a great uh, aspect as well. Listen, mental health Thank is you. where it's at. You know, I mean, yeah. to me, children are far more than the sum of their data. And don't get me wrong. We've taken a school that was slated to be closed and moved it to outperform citywide and statewide standards. And I'm grateful for that. And that's focusing on pedagogy. And a lot of that has to do in communities like ours by attracting the next generation of young leaders like you guys. Look, I'm probably the oldest guy on this call by at least a decade. Um, and how do you inspire young people to come to communities like this um, is by creating warm, nurturing, safe environments that allow young people to be involved and engage in community members to want to be a part of it. Um, you know, schools aren't going anywhere. Um, but Steve, um, Stephen, yeah. for you, you, what do we say to people and, and anybody else here? When we are in schools, we don't get what Kofi said, the whole, the holistic. What we get is we break it down. We break it down into a sub six subjects. And we, and you know, what we do, we say, yeah, help to have help. What else? Can, I mean, that's what we do. It's not like, and I'm saying what we, I, I think it's almost like we have to take on those challenges because right now that's how it's presented. Listen, I'm taking subjects. on those challenges. And, and let me be clear, you know, uh, I fight for children on a daily basis. I fight for children. I'm sure everyone on this phone call does too. Um, but, you know, we fight for children who are born in places most people don't want to be caught dead in. That I can assure you. Um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I fight for children who don't have a room to call their own. I fight for children who don't see dentists. Um, you know, the, the cost of poverty here is so high and cheap food is so damn expensive. It is all killing us. A and that's the problem. Um, but, you know, at some point, 
you got to take a stand. I know I, for one, did take a stand. Those who are familiar with my story know, you know, I gave a, a middle finger to the Board of Education. I, I refused to do certain things that they asked me to do, um, you know, and I got in trouble for it. But, you know, guess what? I survived. You know, I'm here. You know, I'm here and I'm, I'm thriving. My community is thriving. My children are thriving. And, um, you know, the degree to which we resist injustice is a degree to which we are all free. Um, so this work requires a lot of courage. This, this conversation is not for the, the, the meek and the timid. Um, not if you're going to be a game changer. This work requires courage. Now, you know, you want to go down that, that six period a day subject class, but guess what? It's time for me to say goodbye. You want to talk truth. I, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, to opt in. And this, the opposite of courage here is not cowardice. The opposite of courage here is conformity because even a dead fish can go with the flow. And uh, <laughs> I'm not a dead fish and neither are many of the kids who come to my classroom. So I'm going to teach those kids how to swim and, and we're going to keep swimming and advocating. And, you know, we opened up by talking about, you know, uh, having a seat at the table. Look, we build our own. You know, that's what this is that's, about. It's time for community that is, that is absolutely inside instead yes. of outside. Uh, Superman is coming. I hate to be the uh, the dream shatterer. Superman isn't coming. Um, you know, I know the police are riding around here now on horses, but I haven't seen anybody else on a white horse come down here and say, you know, Ooh, we're going to, you know, snap our fingers and make it great. Um, so it's on us. But I do believe therein is the beauty is the beauty and ability to replicate it and grow the next generation of thriving young people that are breaking the paradigm, that are ending the cradle to prison pipeline and are really taking charge of their own health by understanding that they just don't have to be consumers. They can produce think, it, and on top of it, they can sell it. I think you make a um, point there, Stephen, about um, the fact that you can create your own table. That's, that's what you're talking about as agency. And when you're in an environment that's putting so much influence on you, there's a component of agency where we can empower ourselves. You know, we can empower ourselves as an education, as an um, education organization, you know, to, to do something differently. Because as Kofi said, the mental health services that students receive is largely provided by the school. So how do we kind of rethink what we're able to do to change that school environment so that it's really nurturing students and allowing them to thrive um, and allowing us to change that trajectory? Like, what are the levels of that? You know, so many people are involved in school. You have administrators, you have teachers, you have the students themselves. So, um, you know, part of what Big Picture Living is really trying to do is engage that agency. It's to amplify the agency. It's to activate the agency of students um, and have them supported by their um, advisors, their administrators to be able to create a new culture of health for themselves. And that culture of health in, in, includes physical and mental health and spiritual health and social health, which are all of the dimensions of a human. So, you know, thoughts about like, what are the different places we intersect there? Project-based learning, for sure. It has to be project-based learning. And, and what I mean, listen, I grow vegetables, but I really don't grow vegetables. I grow students, but it is the art and science. The kids, the young kids here think they're coming to school to grow food. Um, but along the way, they're learning to cooperate and collaborate. They're learning to read, write, and do math. They're learning to think about the future. They're learning to understand cause and effect. So for me, you know, education, and I hate to use the word um, bright spot and COVID or silver lining, but <laughs> what we have really learned is that teaching is broken. Um, and it's been broken for a long time and COVID has really, really called that to light. You know, we no longer need a uh, sage on the stage. That, that, that's long since, you know, there, there's more information here than in my little phone than they'll ever be in a school library. You know, children have access to information. They know how to act, they're digital natives. They know how to do this. Uh, they need guides on the sides. They know, uh, you know, they need teach people who are facilitators, if you will, referees, teaching them how to stay within the bounds of normalcy and respect differences, how to collaborate and cooperate, not how to stay in line and, and you know, and hand in worksheets. Those days are long gone. Um, and it's this time we, we really embrace that. It's time we have some very difficult talks and very difficult conversations with teachers unions who are putting the rights of teachers long before the rights of children. Um, you know, I'll say that first and foremost, I'm the president of the Children's Union. 
And that's what I'm gonna advocate for first and foremost each and every day. And we really got to think about how do we engage community? Yes, we are local parentis, um, but we need to also bring in the community. And you know, I've always, as an educator, pushed the walls of my classroom as far out into the community and what my community is. So it's an emphasis on project-based learning. It's an emphasis on, on career readiness. Uh, you know, I know my plumber drives a much nicer car than the principal of my school building. Um, so it's time to start thinking about what careers are available uh, for our children in these communities. And, and it's really starting to think about equity. You know, how do we get kids involved? You know, you know, we've got to really make the, you, we're either involved in a participatory democracy or we're not. And, and you know, and that it starts in a classroom by giving children voice, by giving them agency, by giving them choice and respecting who they are, not telling them where to sit and what to do, but how do we get to a better place together? I think that's so, that's that's critical, that that piece. I mean, that's the, the mission of big picture learning is to create a life of your own design. That's the height of agency, number one. And then there's so many parallels because as you're describing how COVID, you know, highlighted or put this bright light, whatever the case, on things that we already knew were happening. That's the same story from the healthcare standpoint, literally like verbatim, <laughs> what COVID has done to highlight health disparities and highlight the brokenness of all these systems um, in our country right now. Um, Kofi, you're actually doing work with trying to activate that agency in families with um, lifestyle intervention and programs that you're trying to build you know, at um, Children's. Maybe you can share a little bit about how you're trying to intervene, you know, maybe from the medical standpoint with building agency in, in a family and um, their ability to take, care, take control of their health, you know? Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, for that question. I think just to add on a bit as well. So in healthcare, um, in working in settings that I work, you know, we try to bring in this mentality of sort of a trauma-informed approach to healthcare, right? And I think it's very similar in schools as well, right? If, if you bring in a trauma-informed approach, you have an awareness of how toxic stress affects your families, the kids, their home life. And you kind of take that perspective as you sort of intervene, right? As you support uh, the children, as you support the family, as you work alongside the communities, right? As Stephen is mentioning, all of that is critically important, working closely with the family, right? Um, and, and working with the capacity and the sort of the, the bandwidth that families have and just kind of being aware of that, I think is, is really important. As for us, um, so some of the great work we're doing, so we do some really great collaborative uh, work in, in our institution where we have a community advisory board sort of overseeing uh, our work we're doing and giving us a lot of guidance in, in the work we're doing as well. We believe strongly in, in food sovereignty and giving families that autonomy. And we, we've been working with uh, sort of local food hubs and providing fresh produce to our families from local African-American uh, farmers at that and trying to pr provide meaningful livable wage to the farmers, right? So the reality is keeping, understanding the local food system, understanding how that money is and, and, and paying for the true cost of food and what we're doing. And also making sure that families are able to benefit from that as well. Uh, with COVID, we've seen some changes with sort of the food security packages, uh, for lack of better words, with WIC, with SNAP, with all these different things. And some of these things are now sort of in place to be better moving forward. So SNAP, for example, has increased uh, to historically high levels uh, as of October 1st of last year. And we sort of try to work alongside that, making sure that families are connected, knowing uh, how they can get connected to more sustainable resources. But on top of that, also making sure that they're connected to some of that local food as well, that's really important for them to thrive as well. So that's some of the work we're doing. We're doing some home deliver, uh, delivery, we're doing some patient education um, with local providers of color, uh, working with our families and communities of color, working together. And, uh, it's, it's been a really, really great thing to see. Mm -hmm. like this this makes me wonder something. Even Marsha Gale, it's like how we work together. Like, are there other examples out there with, you know, those in the medical field work with educators on for the behalf of youth? Um, because I'm listening to you, Kofi, and I'm like, man, I like as a principal, I don't know if I thought about it like this. And, and where was and, he when you were a principal, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, well, you know, like, we're sitting in those happen? compliance meetings, man, and we've got to break that mold. You know, kudos to Co what Kofi's talking about. You know, I just want to amplify one of the most interesting things, and it's going to give, it's going to make you smile, Kofi. I hope you know, like when I started this work with overage, undercredited children, 
um, and young people, basically kids coming in and out of prison. The whole idea was to keep them out of jail and get them a job. But, you know, they grow this food, they'd be involved in living wage and fair wage opportunities, but they wouldn't eat the food. You know, they'd go and make their paycheck, go home and, you know, eat at McDonald's or eat fast food. You know, we got 50 states of fried chicken with an eight square blocks here uh, in my neighborhood. But the big, and, you know, I would talk to them and, you know, my own story I shared with you before, many people on this call know, you know, I went from being a almost professional athlete to being a real good athlete well into my forties, you know, eating food with kids that was available to over 300 half pounds, hence the big cheese, you know, diabetic, heart attack, the whole bit. Now I could tell kids what to eat, 16, 17, 18 year old. I could tell parents, they can send it home, the kids who are growing it and grandparents look at the kids and say, that's great, go get a job. And you know, the older kids, they want cell phones, sneakers and sex. But when you send it home with little children who are growing it and say, grandma, can you use this? Grandma, can you use less salt? You know, I learned in school, grandma is far more likely to acknowledge what these children are learning in school, these, these little ambassadors. Um, because you're like, no one wants to be horrible to a little kid, um, no matter how horrible your conditions at home are. So we're really using these young people as, as agents of education for older people and getting them involved, um, which, which has been game changing. One of the first things that we did here is we got little kids um, growing prescriptive greens for senior citizens who are food insecure and recovering from cancer. And this food was literally their medicine. And we had, you know, little third graders growing it each and every week, bringing it to seniors who were living in their building who didn't have access to it and needed this food as medicine. And, and, and the social capital that this built within our community was just game changing. Now those seniors come in and they're reading volunteers. They're downstairs in front of the building, making sure the kids are safe. They're working in our school. Uh, you know, my fresh fruit and vegetable man in school was a parent volunteer. Uh, you know, he's now on the school leadership team. So it's building these small concentric circles of success that we take ownership of at each and every level. And it's, it yeah. sometimes means answering less emails and, uh, you know, and telling tell people above and me that to is, where I'm at. And that is what's happening the next, next week. Um, this is a little plug right quick, because you're mentioning um, we're, we're going to be talking to students. Um, who are taking on this uh, this concern and, and what they're doing about the issue. And so um, that will be happening next Tuesday. So, um, but yeah, giving that back I, to. I, I wanted to ask you, Stephen, how, like, how many pounds of food are you able to offer for this particular program that you have to cancer patients? Like what's the level of um, impact that you're having. I, know it's I, I love that question. Girl, you just hit me up. In 2021, Green Bronx Machine, and we are a small nonprofit. I am a volunteer. We only have one employee using the second part of the word community, the com and the unity, delivered over 150,000 pounds of food right here in the South Bronx, door to door to seniors. We rescued over 100,000 pounds of food from the landfill. We grew over 10,000 pounds of food with children in school, and we delivered over 1,500 lessons to children. We launched a TV show in partnership with PBS uh, that touched 2 million children. And that, and that TV show was filmed by kids using an iPhone right here in the South Bronx. Um, so it's not about, you know, impossible. It's about I'm possible as long as we start owning every single bit of means of production. And getting ourselves, you know, both not only in front of the camera for someone else's sob story, but behind the camera to redefine the narrative of our story. And, and that's really what this work is about. You know, we are a small but mighty organization. Um, you know, we're in over 500 schools across the country. And, you know, my goal is really, you know, I'm excited about the, the, the show next week only because my goal as an organization is for me to get the hell out and let it be a student run organization. So if you've got kids who know how to run this, send them our way. Um, you know, those who know oh, me know yeah. I put my money where my mouth is. Um, so we're hiring, we're growing, we're on a strategic plan um, that is going to bring this program to believe it or not, to over 5,000 schools in the country within the next three years. Um, you know, we've got a lot of support from the mayor. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful for his support. Um, but we've been a strong, mighty little secret here in the Bronx, but in terms of data, we have transformed school after school after school across the country, both on the academic side and on the social determinants of health side, which means it's win, win, win for that immediate community. And those, those principals who for years were saying, oh, what am I going to do? I got to hit my PPR. You know, I got two years to get this or I'm going to be on employment. 
Um, you know, so it, it, it's really been game changing, but you know, it requires taking a tough stand. It requires to say what you mean and mean what you say, and also walk the walk, um, which I'm proud to do. I just and I to say everybody that. else out there who's doing the same, because that's why I said yes to this. I'm very much aware of who and what is part of this network. So thank you right. all to each and every one of you who are part of this movement. I, I just wanted to say that that's amazing. I just wanted to pause and acknowledge that. <laughs> right. Amazing, amazing. Um, I, I think uh, just a small nugget, I think, you know, transitioning to whole real plant slanted foods is tough at times when everything else around you is has hijacked, hijacked your taste buds, right? Highly calorically dense, nutritionally poor, easy to access, cost effective, you know, processed foods that aren't real foods, right? That they say have they have strawberries on the front of the package but taste nothing like strawberries have been super saturated with flavors and then eating the fresh strawberry doesn't have enough flavor to you so this this uh recognizing this and kind of approaching it from both ends on the ground that steven is doing and changing around policy as well it, i mean that that's that magic solution and, and it's awesome to yeah, see you just hit the record. word brother you know my next fight is policy listen if you are a six foot bodega front with a seven foot hookah mm. pipe in the window you do not deserve to take ebt i'm sorry you know it's just simple policy that we can change uh that's my next battle no i'm not announcing my candidacy but, but, in this phone call but watch for what's coming next but steven i hear that but i'm i got it i got it this is for everybody here I'm sorry, and this is speaking to a majority and how do we get to those minds? Yes, it's just, a. am just speaking, there's somebody thinking, look, right now they're thinking, I still get to feed those who are hungry right now. What do we say to that? What do we say to those people? Like, I don't think they understand what they're feeding the kids because then you were breaking that down, Kofi. Like, I don't think I, I sure didn't understand when they when they're eating pizza in the morning and I'm thinking and they're telling me I get I get forms that say, yeah, this is what you give them. Um, so I don't think we sometimes as educators, yes, Stephen gets it. Like, wh what are we eating when it's low, when it's like the manufactured and inexpensive? Well, what, what you're eating is very it's cheap and inexpensive, but it's costly and slow poison. That's the reality and make no doubt about it. Listen, in communities like these, we don't even get choices. The sales on the products that are coming our way are largely determined by what the manufacturers six months out want to try out in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, if you really understand um, the underpinnings, if you will, and the structures that have been put in place to keep people exactly where they are, that, that's a much larger conversation. But I think it really has to do with what, understanding what food is. And, and that, that, that's part of a conversation that you need to have with children at the youngest age. I have children and it's mine. I mean, listen, I'm right here in public housing. You know, you don't believe me, look out the windows. There I am, um, who are now vegan, who don't want to eat fried chicken, who don't want to go to McDonald's, who don't want the 99 cent menu because they understand what it is. And, and you have to capture that. I mean, you have to capture them at a young age. A lot of it, listen, when you teach children about nature, you teach them to nurture. And when you teach children to nurture, we as a society collectively embrace our better nature. I happened to notice in the chat column, there was a woman who put out, I believe it's a woman, and forgive me because I, I don't have the right glasses on, talking about when kids understand that they're being gamed, um, everything changes. And you know, sadly, these our communities, you know, are last at first and everything bad and last and everything good. And and, yeah. and that has to stop. And I'm just also saying it because it's the decision makers, the kids. And I'm, I get what you're saying, Stephen. I just I think sometimes we got to break it down to those details. What is food and what is it? Because when you hungry, when I have hungry kids and right. I get something and it's right. free, that's a challenge. That's real life challenge. That's 100%. all I'm putting on. 100%. But you know, my, the larger argument I would make there, and I'm not discounting, is that you know, this is America. No child should be hungry. It shouldn't have to come to the point. You know, My classroom is set up now. This community is set up. I got a food pantry downstairs in school. We were feeding kids yesterday. We were feeding kids after school. And, and there's no shame in the game to come in here and get food from us. 
and, and, and that's what we've done. So you don't have to make bad decisions. We want you to progressively move up the chain of good decision making, not get there by default. And, and let me be clear, I am not anti ice cream, which children sometimes think I am. And I will, I'm just, ice cream should be a treat. It shouldn't be four days a week. We have made cheap food so convenient in this community for so many reasons um, that that's what people think food is. And we have separated them from the food system that they need to be so much a part of. In addition to the fact that, guess what? Farming right now and urban farming is perhaps one of the greatest avenues for employment for our young people who don't want to spend four years in college. I've got kids managing greenhouses who are you know, making very good livings. Um, who are doing amazing things with their lives and for their families and for their communities. So urban farming, redefining what the possibilities are around food. No one wants to grow up and spend the rest of their life behind a French fry machine. If that's if all you see, that's all you know. Fast casual is really changing that for, you know, as an industry for our community. And I'm really excited about that as well. But we've got to nourish that. We've mm -hmm. got to feed that instead of keep feeding the problem. Right. I Go ahead, Kobe. Look like I was, going, I was gonna. I'm, I'm sorry. The last piece. So you were mentioning. So I love the idea that people was talking about about. Hey, no shame in the game to come and get food, right? And it makes me think about stigma and bias and the idea of like if I were to access school food, what are they going to say about me? Are they going to label me? Uh, it depends on the school setting, of course. But the reality is this: this there are a lot of ways that we can do better in taking away the stigma from school food and quality school food at that, right? by providing food in the classroom setting, right? By, especially like breakfast, allowing breakfast to be something where everybody has access to it, where it's not, oh, that's just for those quote unquote poor kids over there, for those kids over there, right? Like recognizing these kind of initiatives and, and providing, uh, allowing for more sort of uh, an equitable access to food where it's it's not sort of ranked on how much money you have. I think is a, is a critical thing that we have to think about more in terms of reducing the stigma and allowing kids to feel free and eating quality foods to thrive and live healthy lifestyles. You know, the I, I, like the, thing, I like the point about just um, how kids are so intelligent. If you give them the facts, they logically kind of settle into, wait, this doesn't make sense. Like this stuff is gonna affect me now and cause me problems in the future. Um, and kind of as you're saying, um, I just wanted to kind of express that part of the conversation is how we can build that understanding in kids and um, they can be able to move forward together. Oh, I see some people jump. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what I mean? So I think, I think just as you said, it's like um, kids don't like to be gamed. And if we can just make that really clear and start to have more of these discussions where it's like, right, we realize what the situation is. I feel like children will empower themselves and collectively they'll start to say, I want something different. And once they're actually speaking up and demanding something for themselves, that changes a lot. So go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, we, I, I'll share with you, you know, so here we were at one in one of the most, in the poorest congressional district in America, in one of the, 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 the most struggling school districts in all of New York City. And this school, um, in the midst of all its challenges, and there are many, we were the first school to ban chocolate milk. And um, we did it not because it made sense, it's because the children convinced the principal. And you know, the children, we start, the children just started learning how much sugar they consumed, you know, over time. And they took that seven pound bag of sugar and put it on the principal's desk and said, this is what we're doing to ourselves. You've got to stop it. And the principal couldn't look at him them and say, no. So they said, now the teacher said no. Parents said, oh, my baby will never drink milk again. One week later, guess what? No one missed chocolate milk. And the first thing the kids went downstairs to the cafeteria and did when they went, instead of having chocolate milk and a starch and throwing their protein and veg in the garbage, went straight for the protein and straight for the veg and washed it down with a glass of water. So change doesn't happen by itself. Change happens when you empower young people to understand this is gonna make a difference in their life and they convince older people to respond accordingly. And that's, you know, that's what, to me, big picture learning is all about. That's what so many of the wonderful principals who are shooting and educators who are here today really get. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm here to tell you, we can do this. Uh, you know, we really can. Um, you've just got to put your stake in the ground and hold your ground. And, and right now I could speak for New York City. We've got a mayor who supports us. 
Uh, we've got a chancellor who's committed to equity and inclusion in a way that we really haven't heard it before. Um, and you know, I'll close with saying diversity is a fact. Equity is a choice. Um, inclusion is an action, but belonging um, is an outcome. And we want our children to belong. And that's, you know, that's what Green Bronx Machine is all about. That's what I'm all about. That's what I know big picture learning is all about. And I'm honored and humbled to be here with you all today. Uh, I love it. I, hey, when you get your own show, you let us know. <laughs> Dude, I got you my got, own you show. Got, you can go to the Green oh, Bronx Machine website oh, and watch it. Got go. my own book. <laughs> you know, we got a documentary coming. I, I got you covered. <laughs> you go. Get ready. Check We're swinging for the... I'm building a farm at Yankee Stadium. I'm putting it out here. I'm letting you know. Um, so watch out for what's coming. Um, oh, you know, the Bronx is poised, ready, willing, and able to export our talent diversity. And we are coming to a neighborhood near you soon. Yeah, you, you, baby. That's how the Bronx does it. So there's a question for everybody as we close. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the environment of school and where the youth are. And, uh, so, you know, next episode, we're going to hear from youth themselves and the students. But um, as some of the decision makers and some of the people who understand how vital and important this is, what is what are some things that we can do as educators and even across the field, those in the medical field? Um, what can we do either together or just within our field to to help change this? If if, if we didn't say it already, um, to keep my comment. To, yeah, my comment. My comment is on the conversation. Like this, this is important. Like us being able to just say what it is, why we need to talk about it what we see others doing, what we are doing, what we can do. I think that's the first step. So I just love that we were able to even have this to just like demonstrate like this is where we need to start. Sometimes just the information itself, but again, just being able to normalize this type of interaction, you know? So that's my piece. That A big up to that, normalizing these conversations is absolutely a, a, a great start because if we keep looking to the people who put us here to think that they're really going to change things, that ain't happening. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, and uh, like Kofi said before, even a dead clock is right twice a day. I want to be right. You know, I want to be on time each and every day, each and every minute. Um, you know, I will tell you that I found that by leaving the system, I was able to attract far, generate far more change than I ever was being a part in it, of being a part of it. And now the glory is the system wants me back in a huge way. So I'm really able to call a lot of my own shots and really advocate for people and communities. And I, I'm delighted to advocate and partner with anybody who's on this call. I'm easy to reach. People know how to find me. Um, there's no secretary here. It comes straight to me. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll get back to you probably in 48 hours, if not sooner. Um, and the time is now. This is the moment. And you know, let us remember the pain let us remember the names and let us work together to change things in this lifetime starting today. Um, it's on us. You know, there is no justice. There is just us. But, you know, we're formidable. We're mighty. And, uh, you know, we're here to get shiznit done. The time is now. I love that. What are you saying, Kofi? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, a few different things. Uh, so definitely the idea of working together. Uh, I think is is key. We cannot do any of this alone. Uh, as the more I hear Stephen, the the radical nature of uh, of of action is is critically important. At the end of the day, you know, just following the status quo will get us nowhere. And and the reality is, it's so important to shake the system. It's so important to have uh, different voices and allow more people to come to that table and respect those voices and Build your let them. It, 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 I love building your own table, and and when those when those voices come to the table, make sure that they are respected and paid in an equitable way for their voices to be heard, because that is data that many of us use, um, and it's data that we need to make these kind of changes. I'm I'm so encouraged by hearing the work that that Stephen and their teams are doing as well. And I, I guess the other thing I think about from the healthcare standpoint is when I think about sort of. Um, my role and my team members role is the idea of thinking about things not through just a clinical lens or community lens, but recognizing the power of clinical community collaboratives, the idea of focusing on the family, the child in the center, and being able to seamlessly integrate our care back and forth with health equity and family in the center. I think that's so important. And for me, I think it's about making sure we do what we're doing 
um, crossing over. I, 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 I can't do it alone in my field of education and, and without hearing from Kofi who might work with you know, youth in a different way as a, as a medical doctor or in Marsha Gale. And even, and you know, and work with Stevens of the world who kicking indoors. I think it's all of us working together. And if you are work, if if you work on the behalf of students or youth in any way, then we should be talking with one another. All of us should be talking on the behalf of you um, and getting deeper into it. So I want to thank everybody. This has been episode two, Thriving in Schools and How Your Environment Shapes Your Choices. I want to thank Stephen Ritz. I want to thank uh, Kofi, I want to get the name, last name right, Isel, and um, good old Dr. Boskiel Davis. Thank you once again. Um, anything you want to say in closing, good sister? You got the last word. This It's just been amazing. Thank you guys so much for joining us and just having this conversation, just being authentic, expressing your passions. Like this is, like you said, Stephen, the time is now. And um, Kofi, like you said, it's about collaboration. It's about that community connection. It's about sectors coming together. So I think just the fact that we are talking about it um, is a good sign that we're really moving in this direction. We're going to get more people to continue to do that too. All right. And we'll see people next week, week, right? Yes. Okay. Same time. Well, same time, different day. Remember, it's Tuesday, January 18th. So we'll be having our students coming to share how they are actually activating their agency and it's they're leading the way in how to change you know cultural health for themselves i'm so excited to have them share well tell those kids we'll be hiring this summer so you know you vote with your fork you vote with your wallet and you vote with your mouth so use them all expeditiously and you vote at the ballot so keep getting kids registered to vote jeff i love you andrew i love you um and thanks to everyone for all the nice comments and uh -huh. however i could be supportive i'm an email or a phone call away Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, Thank you all. all right.